Hi everyone, welcome to RAM Chat. Thank you for coming. We're here today with Janet Jenke, the Director of Admissions Operations here at CSU Vet School, and also Nigel Miller, who is a fourth year large animal vet student. And I am Stacy Hunvold, and I'm a second year uh, small animal vet student. Um, we're going to each introduce ourselves. Um, so I um, was fortunate enough to start to come to CSU after having a career first as a so software engineer. So I was actually a non-traditional student. Um, I love that school. I'm interested in small animals mainly. I love oncology work, and I also love um, figuring out different ways for people to be able to afford veterinary care for their animals, um, like novel business models and that sort of thing. Um, I guess to that point, I'm also an MBA combined student, so if anyone has questions about our combined programs, I can help you out with that. And now, um, Nigel, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Hi, everybody. I am a, as uh, Stacy said, large animal tracking fourth year. Um, my interest is primarily um, equine medicine uh, with some ruminant nutrition and uh, other large animal interests that I hope to pursue later on. I'm from Elizabeth, Colorado, and went out into the profession. And Janet will introduce herself next. Hi, I'm Janet Jenke. I'm the Director of Admissions Operations. I help with the application, the development of the application, uh, getting the faculty all set up with the review of all the applications, and then also with um, all the applicant communications and the, all of the information on the applicant portal pages and then also helping with setting up tours and visits. We have a couple of current DVM students that help a lot with that um, and usually those are a lot of fun when people come to visit so that's what we do here. Thanks Janet. Um, so don't forget, you can submit questions by using the comment section below or also by using hashtag RamChat in any social media. Um, and then before we get to the, to the questions, we also, Janet has a um, presentation about important application dates and then we'll get to some live questions. Thanks so much. First, I'd like to tell you about our pre visit day that's coming up in just about a week um, or two, I guess. It's on a Saturday, and it's in running in parallel with the open house for the veterinary teaching hospital. But our pre visit day is a hosted visit day, and if you are thinking of applying in the next year or two, it would be a really good event for you to attend. There will be a lot of good information, um, faculty there, our assistant dean, of admissions and you probably get a lot of your questions answered and you'd be able to see our facilities too. Also you probably want to know um, some of the new things we have for the new application cycle. We call it the 2017 application cycle because that's the year you would matriculate. It would be fall of 2017. But new this year we are going to require the analytical GRE score. Uh, we are and then on the VIMCAS application, in the past we have used the PPI letter of reference. We are no, that has been discontinued and we will no longer use that. And so we will use the VIMCAS LOR, which is short for letter of reference, and that is all hosted by VIMCAS. And then also the third one, probably the biggest one, is we are bringing back interviews. And we have that planned for the weekend of January 14th and 15th. That's a Saturday and Sunday. And all invited applicants will be required to participate in that interview process. Some dates you probably should be aware of is that with the VIMCAS application, that is planned to open May 11th. The Colorado supplemental application is scheduled for July 1st. Very important to remember is the, uh, they are both due to be submitted by September 15th, and that is a very strong deadline by both us and VIMCAS. With the GRE scores, we accept any test scores uh, taken within the last five years. So if you have a test date of August 1st of 2011, 
or later we would accept those scores. And another thing you should know about taking the GRE exam is the last day to take that would be August 15th this summer because it does take some time to get the scoring done, especially with the writing section. One suggestion I would make to, to all applicants is the first thing to do is to think ahead about which three people you would select as your evaluators to write your LOR. Uh, they need a little bit of time, they're busy people, and they need some planning time to write those letters and then to um, get them submitted and get them submitted before the deadline. Another thing that I don't have on the screen here is about transcripts, and those all go to VimCAS, and it's um, really good to get those transcripts into VimCAS as soon as possible and no later than September 1st. They use those transcripts to verify all your courses, credits, and grades that you've entered into the VimCAS application. Once your application is verified, then it can then move into the queue for um, so that other schools can see it. Are there any questions? Hi guys, so now we'll get started with some questions. So the first question is, I realize that any biomedical courses are beneficial, but for those of us who don't have much wiggle room when it comes to electives beyond required courses, are there any classes that are specifically recommended by the admissions committee that would be looked upon favorably or provide useful background? So maybe Janet, if you could answer that from an admissions perspective, then Nigel and I could think about it from a student perspective. Sure. Um, we get this question quite a bit, and our first answer is any of the ology courses are good to take. Um, any upper division biomedical science course is, is good, um, and it will help you in the program too, it'll give you a good background. So on our um, page, our web page where we list prerequisite requirements, there is a section there where we talk about it, and we suggest, highly recommend it classes like microbiology, cell biology, developmental biology, anatomy, physiology, histology, nutrition, and any other advanced biomedical science courses. Nigel, do you have anything to add to that? At least uh, personally from my perspective, um, I came from a program that was uh, not CSU. I went to um, out of state for undergrad. And I really wish I would have taken additional um, anatomy and physiology courses. Um, that was my biggest struggle in the first year. I had taken some upper division, uh, bacteriology, parasitology, a lot of nutrition courses. Those are really helpful um, later on in the program. First semester with anatomy, I wish I had a better kind of grasp on that coming into the program. So that'd be my personal recommendation. And I totally agree with that. I also hadn't had anatomy, and I think it would, if you're going to pick from all those optional ologies, that'd probably be my top choice in retrospect. <laughs> okay, here's another question. Um, what are some things you did on your application that helped you get into CSU's DVM program? So, Nigel? Um, uh, I'm trying to think. I don't know specifically what helped me the most. I had a pretty diverse background. Um, I was fortunate to be raised um, on a farm, so I had a lot of animal experience coming in. Uh, I spent uh, quite a bit of time in undergrad working in different vet clinics. Um, 
I got some hours there. I know some people really stress out about that, uh, making sure they have you know X number of hours. I think just being exposed to the profession is most important. Make sure you want to do this before you apply and commit four years of your life to this education and the rest of your career. Probably, you know, just one additional thing is just being involved in extracurriculars, whether it's clubs at school or uh, different clubs in your community, I think that's helpful. I agree. Um, I think having kind of a, di a more diverse background might be helpful. Um, if you are doing, like you, everybody needs to have community service type of things, animal type of hours, um, veterinary clinic type of hours. And I think kind of diversifying those as much as possible is, what maybe I did better on my application. Um, I think I was at a bit of a disadvantage because I had fewer hours than most people, but they were pretty diverse. So I think that was helpful. And then I also had like volunteer experience that wasn't all about animals. So it kind of showed that I was interested in my community beyond just becoming a vet student and just also being able to communicate with people in, um, that you usually do in other types of service as well. All right, another question. Maybe we'll start with Janet on this one. Um, can I still apply with a low cumulative GPA? Yes, you can. Um, we have quite a few applicants um, who turn out to be strong applicants. Uh, maybe they didn't have a stellar beginning, but if they have an upper trend in their courses and their grades, um, that's what the committee likes to see. So. Uh, a lower GPA, um, don't be afraid of that. I, if you've got great experience and great GRE scores, those will help you a lot, help balance out that lower GPA. But probably um, the important thing there is showing an upward trend in your grades and being able to carry a strong credit loads and getting good grades. I can add to that too. So when I was an undergrad, I actually had a pretty low GPA. I think I graduated with like a 2.85 in an engineering program. Um, that was several years ago. Like I said earlier, I'm a second career vet student. So the thing I tried to do to make up for that and to have this upward trend like Janet mentioned is to really do well when I went back to get my prerequisites. So to counter that, I did really well on my prereqs. And, um, and there's also areas in the application to talk about why you might have had um, some trouble with your grades. And I think that's part of the holistic um, idea that Janet was talking about in terms of looking at an application as a whole and not just one or two um, numerical factors on it. I would agree with that. If, there, if you have a dip or even a slow start, I, if you can explain that, and there is, like Stacey said, there is a, a place in the application for you to do that. But if it can be explained and it's kind of a one-time thing, the committee certainly understands this. Understands. Okay, another question. Who should I select as evaluators? Janet? Uh, we do, at CSU, we do have a recommendation. Um, we ask for three letters of reference, and we ask for one to be from an academic resource, one from an employment resource, and especially one from a veterinarian. Ultimately, we say to go with who you are most comfortable with as evaluators, but at least one should be from a veterinarian. The veterinarian uh, reference is very important. Thank you. Okay, this one is for the students. Um, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of tracking? So Nigel, I think they mean in terms of small and large animal. Yeah, you know, I having you know gone the past year through that and really tracking begins at CSU uh, partway through your third year um, when you start selecting classes and more large animal um, for me that's where my career focus will be I think CSU does a good job getting you set up in your second year um, with both small and large animal classes and provide you a lot of education there um, I think one disadvantage for me was um, taking boards that the small animal material um, I had spent a lot of time with that you have minimal rotations in the clinic um, 
in small animal. And so that was one area I really had to focus on to make sure that I could do well on boards and pass that section. I do like the large animal section. They give you um, a little extra time to do some electives and externships. And so you can do those either here at CSU or at outside clinics. And that kind of gave me an opportunity to go out and look for uh, an internship and jobs while still being a student and seeing things outside of clinics here. I think Nigel has probably the most experience to answer that since he's a fourth year. Um, but what I can say from what I've heard from classmates, um, so the so the choice is um, you make a decision just prior to your fourth year of whether to track um, small animal, large animal, or mixed. And so if you know you're going to go into small animal, it is it is generally recommended to track small animal because you have more opportunities on your rotations in the fourth year to um, work in the various specialties associated with small animal. Um, if you track, for instance, mixed, you get a a mixture of large animal and small animal rotations, but you might you don't get to do all of the small animal ones, so you might not get to do like a cardiology rotation, um, or you know just depending you might not go as far into small animal medicine. Um, but then, like Nigel said, then on the boards, people who track mix might have opportunities to know a little bit more across um, all the species. But sometimes there's some concern that you maybe are an expert in a lot of things, or I'm sorry, are generally knowledgeable in a lot of things, but not really an expert in either thing. So that's sort of um, the quandary there. But I think like everything else too, what you're passionate about is what you're going to do well in and learn about a lot. So um, choosing something that is really what um, you are interested in is your best bet. Okay, here is another question. Um, she says, I am still a student in high school and I've been looking into being a veterinarian. I'm wondering what I could do now to put me on track to going to vet school. Um, Nigel, do you have some suggestions for this person? Uh, I started in high school just shadowing some vets in my I was fortunate enough that with our family farm, we had a lot of vets you know, coming to our place or hauling horses uh, to them. But um, doing either something along the lines of the work study, shadowing uh, is good, just kind of get you experience in there and then really focusing on your grades, uh, getting prepared for your college application and uh, kind of heading down that route because uh, it is very important to do well not only in high school, but also in college. And they look at your college grades pretty, um, you know, they want to see that you can do well, not only your first year, but all the way through your fourth year and with the applications committee. Yeah, I always like when students ask this question, I actually give tours at the hospital, so I have an opportunity to talk to people who are interested in the vet program. And a lot of times it's high school students who are coming in and the cool thing about if you're in high school now is you can think about what your what you want your application to look like five or six years from now, and then you can actually build your um, activities around that. You still have all the time in the world to decide how you would want that to look and fulfill that. Um, so definitely, you, obviously, you want to start getting involved, like Nigel said. Start get, um, understanding what's involved in the career. Sometimes when um, people decide early that they want to go to vet school, they might not realize um, some of the parts that are not as um, easy or glorious as some of the funner parts of veterinary medicine. Um, so really sh like shadowing veterinarians, you get to know the, the profession and see if it really is for you um, and start working down that route. And then yeah, start thinking about like how you would have that application balance going down the line. Janet, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, a lot of times from students uh, just beginning in college, we get a question of, is there a better major? What major should I choose? What school should I go to? And there's not really a right or wrong answer to that. Of course, any science major is best. But what we tell people most often is that select a major and an environment that you'll do well in because the committee is going to be more concerned about what courses you took preferably in upper division biomedical science, and how you did in them versus what major you were. So, so 
selecting those upper division courses and doing well in them is, is what's going to uh, help you the most. Great, thanks. Okay, so another question from our audience. What is valued most, quantity or quality of volunteer hours? Janet? <laughs> Um, volunteer hours are good. Um, the extracurricular activities are, are valued by the committee. Uh, and I, I think the biggest, uh, one of the big things that extracurricular activities have to offer are volunteer opportunities, not volunteer opportunities, but leadership opportunities. So, and giving back to the community. So all of that is good. Then the extracurricular activities don't have to involve animals. You don't have, you can get your animal experience doing that. And a lot of people do. But it's also an opportunity to do other things, get different types of experience. Um, you get experience working with people, networking, and developing your communication skills, giving back, and again, you know, organizing a, um, a marathon or a food drive. That um, those can be valuable community activities. Thanks, Janet. Okay, here's another question. I'm a non-traditional student looking to apply to CSU's vet med program. Do you have any tips or suggestions for creating a strong application for those of us who've been out of school for a few years or have been working in an unrelated field besides the general advice on CSU's website, such as grades and having volunteer hours? I'll let you answer that first, Janet. Sure. Um, this, we get this question quite a bit too, um, and non-traditional students are a wide variety of people and we welcome them. Our general advice to them is to is to go back to school. Um, in the end, you want to have a couple of semesters, two, three semesters of uh, strong credit loads and good grades and taking up upper division science. So you could go back and you could do a second bachelor's or maybe a first bachelor's, complete a first bachelor's, um, or do a master's program. And uh, taking uh, those ology courses and doing well in them, that would give you a, a solid two, three semesters. And that would be good. For the committee would want to see that because they really want to see you present evidence that you can handle a rigorous upper, um, upper division science curriculum because you will get four years of that in the DVM program. And then I can say in my experience, so once I decided to go back to school or decided that I wanted to pursue veterinary medicine, um, I also started with going back to school. Um, I actually had to take biology 101 because I had a lot of science in my background, but no life science. Um, so that's a good way to find out if you really are interested in pursuing this. Because when I first started, I thought, okay, this is like a seven year plan for me with the prereqs and everything. Um, and then it'll just be kind of like a means to an end. And I think if I continue to see it that way, there's no way you can go seven years with the amount of course load that is required if you're just doing it to get to this end point. But what actually happened to me is I actually loved going back to school so much more than I have enjoyed my undergraduate work. Um, so you might find that, you might not. Um, but actually going back to school and seeing if you like it is really important. Um, in the meantime, you also have to get your uh, the other things you need for your application. If it's anim if you don't have a lot of animal hours experience, you I will say that I never like the numbers that we publish on the website of average student animal hours. Um, I think it's a thousand clinical and a thousand non-clinical. I didn't get that far. I had more than a thousand non-clinical, but I think I maybe made it to 400 as far as clinical. Um, so that also speaks to just not everything is quantitative on the application. Um, being able to do like another thing I think that helped me is that I was working full time while I was getting my animal hours and going to school half time. And that probably showed, like Janet was saying, that I could probably handle a pretty rigorous course load. Um, and then that worked out for me. Um, I think, I guess, also for a strong application, utilizing whatever you have been doing for your first career um, in whatever way you can, like maybe like in my software job, I had a lot of customer interaction and training experience. So being able to tie on my application, how that would, how my experience that I did have, even though it was totally not animal related, would tie into me still being a good veterinarian, I think was probably hopefully helpful. Um, all right, another question. So, um, 
Given that I'm a sophomore, what activities can I be involved in during the next few years to make me a stronger candidate? Um, how much for the vet students on the panel? How much time did you devote each semester to extracurricular activities? And are there certain extracurricular activities more important than others? So, Nigel, let me let you answer this one first. I've probably spent too much time. I've probably spent too much time. Uh, I don't know if you guys are getting the same feedback. Um, hope you're the same feedback. Hope. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. Um, I was fairly committed. Um, I was fairly committed. Clubs and doing those kind of clubs and doing those kind of things. So I don't know if there is a, you know, right amount of time. I think it's all personal. Up to each individual person. If they can do well in school and to be part of a lot of extracurriculars, great. If not, it's about building. Um, so. I think that's what really matters. I don't think there is, you know, Jenna maybe may correct me. I don't think there's a perfect applicant. I think everyone kind of comes at it from a different perspective, and you have to highlight what, who you are, and what you want to do, and what you've done in the past. Janet, what would you like to add? I would agree with Nigel. There isn't a perfect applicant. Everybody is different, and that's um, that's valued, and that helps the profession too. So, just try to build on your strengths. Um, try to to get your veterinary experience. Do well in your coursework, um, and take the upper division science, and get a lot of different kinds of experiences so that you can kind of get a good idea of what you want to do, what you're good at, and what you're passionate about, and, and then build on that. And I think as Stacy said earlier, you will end up doing well what you're passionate in. So find, find that niche. All right, another question for Nigel and I. Um, can you explain a little on how the exams at the beginning of every academic year work? Right. So I think that's referring to our capstone exam that we have. And so um, after your first year of the day, first day of your second year, you take a capstone exam, it's a full day exam, end of second year, uh, or end of, yeah, start of third year, you take one that covers your second year. And then the last uh, couple days before you start your fourth year, you take a capstone exam. Um, it's basically a comprehensive review of all the material you learned in the previous year, uh, or in the second, third year, throughout your entire education. Um, there's questions on there related to the first day of class um, when you take it starting right before the start of your fourth year. So um, I think they are very beneficial in getting you prepared for boards. Um, you know, I know some people spend a lot of time in the summers, summer studying for them. Some people didn't study at all. Uh, it does, at least for myself, it's great to be able to review the material before starting second year really help me apply it. To my education going forward. I don't know about you, Stacy. I totally agree. As much as um, maybe it's not the thing you want to do the most is take these tests. Definitely being forced to review everything um, after the summer or some either over the summer or at least in August or whatever works for you um, definitely gives you a better ability to kind of hit the ground running for the all semesters without having lost too much from over the summer um, and otherwise I think Nigel explained it really well um, the goal with the test I think is to help people besides um, reviewing everything in time for the next school year it also everybody has to take the NAVLI or the board exams in their fourth year and um, the capstones intended to sort of emulate that so that people can be having some practice toward that um, before they actually get to that exam. So then we have really good pass rates on the exam. Um, so hopefully it's, a, it's mainly a good experience. <laughs> All right, another question. When is the best time to visit the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences? Janet? Well, I, I think there's uh, several different times to come and visit. Um, you can come as you're applying, uh, or you can come to um, before you apply. Uh, 
or you could come after we release decisions. And if you are one of those candidates that receives an offer, that might be a time that you want to come to. Of course, now that we're implementing interviews, uh, you would come to our campus for the interview and get a chance to see the facilities on that day too, as we would be offering tours and you would be meeting faculty too also. So I think it would be probably what works best for your travel plans and what else you have going on with school and work and, and other things. Uh, one, we do offer Monday, Wednesday, Friday, four o'clock tours at the teaching hospital. So once you figure out what time of year you wanna come, you might plan to come on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. And the only thing I would add to that, I give some of those tours. <laughs> and um, just from biosecurity reasons, we can't tour the large animal facilities. Um, and the open house that Janet mentioned in um, with respect to the pre-vet day that's coming up on April 16th, if you happen to be in town and can come to that, um, that's a great day to come because you actually can see the large animal facilities. They do this giant clean out of everything afterwards. And so they allow the public to come in for that one day of year. Um, so if you can arrange it to, co uh, to coordinate with that, that's awesome. You get to see just a, you get a little bit more of a peek in. All right, what can I do to make my application stand out? I think we'll start with Janet for that one too, and then maybe Nigel and I can uh, give a few tips. I think this is kind of a hard question to answer because as we said before, there isn't a perfect application. There isn't a perfect, perfect applicant. Again, it's kind of building on what you are passionate about, what you feel you are best at, and just highlighting those experiences. Sometimes um, some of your earlier animal or veterinary experiences might be uh, cleaning kennels, but instead of just saying cleaning kennels, you might talk about what you learned from that, what you took away with that, how you interacted with the animals, how what you learned about animals in doing that. So even though it might seem like a uh, an experience that wasn't very important, try, try to turn it into something that um, was more important and kind of what you took away from it. Stacy, can you think of anything else when you were filling out the application that you could add to that? Um, kind of depends on where the questioner is coming from in her process. So if she's about, if he or she is about to apply in um, this cycle, then you obviously have the things to work with that you've already done. Um, one thing I would say about that is don't forget things. Don't sell yourself short. Sometimes I have had like people I know who are applying and they'll, I'll talk to them about their application and they'll, or even just this happens on resumes all the time too. And um, you're reviewing it and you're like, well, what about these four other things that I just know you did personally that maybe you didn't think were important enough to put on the application. Maybe it wasn't animal related or, um, you only got to go out one day with like a camelid vet or something like that and then you think you don't think to put those on or you don't think they're significant enough put them on if you have room if there's a space for them put them on <laughs> um, more is better i think in that um regard if you have longer before you're applying um i always go back to kind of having this diverse experience i think that's helpful um if you have, you know, we have a lot of people who apply who've already been in tech for even like five years. So they might have like 5,000 hours or even more of small animal experience, but it's all specific small animal. Um, that's obviously not a bad situation to be in, but again, just having a diverse amount of things, like even if they had a couple opportunities to spend a week or two in large animal medicine, just to kind of diversify, diversify that, I think is beneficial. Um, also, Again, just having things that you do or classes that you've taken that are just a little bit different than everybody else, I think is, you know, when you're trying to stand out, you're kind of trying to have your thing be a little bit different than everybody else. I think those are always, those are always really good too. So don't forget about the things you've done. And you've done. And also if you're a high school student, write these things down because you will forget as much as you think like, oh my gosh, that was the best three days ever that I spent on that spay and neuter clinic in um, on a reservation or something. I'll never forget that. In six years, you might forget that because you've done like a thousand other things by then. So be right, keeping a journal now so that it's easier to write your application later. Yes, I would echo that. I think that's um, a very, um, Good, very good advice to start tracking these experiences 
uh, recording them, what the duties were, what the dates were, and how many hours they were. Start doing that now. I think that's great. I would echo that also because that was something someone recommended to me freshman year of uh, undergrad, and it was probably the best thing when it came time to finish my application is that I kind of had a little cheat sheet list of experiences that I've done. Yeah, definitely. I did not have that as much. I did once I started deciding to be a vet, but before that I didn't. So when you brain for things that you had done, it's, you know, you're trying to remember the dates, you're trying to remember who was involved with it, so you put references down. It's much easier to keep track as you go along. Okay, so a question for all of us. What is there to do for fun in Fort Collins? Um, let's start with you, Nigel. A whole bunch of different things. Um, everything from, we have, uh, you know, great food. Um, a lot of people mentioned the breweries. If you like to do anything outdoors related, um, Fort Collins is great. You're, you know, 30 minutes from being into the foothills and mountains with some great hiking, climbing, um, whitewater rafting, lots of fishing if you wanted, a couple hours from ski resorts uh, west of Denver, um, out east. Um, we do have some the plains and uh, some opportunity out there in the grasslands. So. I think if you have interest in outdoors, Fort Collins is great for that. There's also, you know, you're within an hour of Denver if you're somewhere for a weekend, that's convenient, makes it great. So, Stacy. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Fort Collins is a great place to be no matter what you're into. Um, like Nigel mentioned, definitely a good downtown scene in terms of, and when I say downtown, it's a small downtown, but it's also a quaint downtown, but in terms of like foodie scene and microbrew scene, but then like I live probably 10 minutes from the veterinary teaching hospital and can probably walk 20 miles of trails with my dogs from my house. Um, so that's really awesome. Um, if you're not familiar with Colorado, it's a super sunny place. Don't tell too many people that because we don't like to let that out. People picture all this snow and that's not in these cold winters and that's not really how it is at all. We have like 300 days of sunshine a year and it's fantastic. Um, so there's always opportunities to go outside and do things. Um, so whether it's whether you're into running or biking or um, lots of like water sports, there's a huge reservoir about 15 minutes away from Fort Collins and people go paddleboarding and boating and all kinds of things like that. Um, skiing obviously is within two hours of Fort Collins. Lots of great skiing. Um, I'm sure I'm overlooking things, um, but also just Colorado is just a very young hip place where um, just people are always out going and having a fun time. So like whatever you're into, there's always people who are willing to do it with you. And that's within your class also. I mean, people have, we have like Facebook pages for each class and people will throw something up there like, hey, I was thinking of going on a hike, um, who wants to come? And I mean, so just, there's just always things to do around here. In fact, the problem is more that you have too many things to do than you actually have time to do. <laughs> Janet? Um, I have a couple, maybe two more things. Um, they cover pretty much everything, but one of my favorite things is actually down in Denver, and it's our Red Rocks Amphitheater. It's an outdoor the amphitheater, and there's a lot of concerts there, and it's all done in the beautiful Colorado red sandstone um, that our, a lot of our mountains are in, and it's, it's um, very scenic, and it's very good acoustically, too. The other thing about Fort Collins is it's a pet-friendly town. There's a lot of stores that are pet-friendly, and it's you can bring your dogs with you and do your shopping and they're all okay with that. And there's like a water bowl in front of like every restaurant patio. So like a lot, I mean, obviously you can't take animals into restaurants just by the laws, but I mean, almost every patio has water dishes for, for people, for their pets on the patio. Um, all right. So what should I get involved in, in terms, this is another question, what should I get involved in, in terms of working with veterinary clinics, extracurricular activities versus lab work versus work experience? Are those weighted differently? And what would be the most important? Um, well, we use the holistic review, so it's not weighted. Um, 
And all of those things actually are important. Um, can you repeat the question? Sure, yeah. Um, they're primarily wondering between work experience, lab research experience, clubs, volunteering, um, other extracurricular activities, and veterinary work. Where to focus their time, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a balance. Each person has to strike. Um, all of those things are important. Um, I think, uh, again, I have to stress academics, are, recent academics are very important, and getting your veterinary experience is also very important. Community activities are, are important too. Um, so I don't I don't have the magic answer for that one. I can just say that they're all they are all important. Nigel, did you have anything? I know you talked about your background as far as extracurriculars, but um, maybe if anything helped you more once you got into vet school, um, even like in terms of this experience really helped me learn better or that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think I was, took several leadership roles uh, here at CSU. A lot of that I felt uh, comfortable doing based off of my undergrad uh, experiences, you know, whether you're involved with the pre-vet club or uh, some other club you have at your school. I guess I, my recommendation would be do something you enjoy, something you, uh, you know, don't do something just to get the hours in because you think it'll make a better application. You won't enjoy that. I worked in a research lab in undergrad. It was a ruminant nutrition lab. And you know, a lot of times got to be working with animals and cattle. Not too much of that experience is applicable in vet school specifically, but you know, it does teach you work-life balance and time management strategies and how to go about that. Because you know, if you're working in undergrad and also studying it, you got to make those decisions and priorities and kind of train yourself to be a good student. Excellent. Okay, another question. Um, I volunteered with an animal rescue in middle school and high school. Can I count those hours as contact hours when I apply? Janet? Um, those hours were in middle school, you said? Um, Usually with the application, because you're going to get so many hours of experience, I would probably, the, the high school hours and, and middle school hours aren't going to be as important. They're going to want to know more about your more recent experiences in probably your undergraduate years of college. I think um, this question might have come from a middle school student, but those, it's all important because it all leads to something else. So don't discount them um, because you will just build on those to, um, to get more and more experience. I might add that they might also play into your personal essay, just if, you know, if that had a lot to do with how you got involved in veterinary work or what it meant to you growing up. Um, that might be something that um, contributes and adds to your personal essay. Okay, another question. What are different ways to get involved in clubs? So, Nigel? There is, I'm trying to figure, remember how many clubs we have at CSU. Probably, probably close to 30 right now in the vet school itself. Um, and there's several new ones that have been created this year and it seems to be more and more. Um, I think my first exposure to it was in the week of orientation the clubs came um, and talked to the incoming first year class. Each had a couple of seconds to feel, um, talk about what they did, what they wanted to do. And I walked away from that uh, lunch kind of talk lecture, wanting to join probably 15 clubs. And then I went ahead and joined probably 10 my first year. Um, at most clubs will have a freshman representative. That's the easy way to get involved. Um, and then the clubs are wholly student run and organized. So um, that's something that there's lots of opportunity for you to be involved. Um, there's also lots of research opportunities here at CSU. Stacy might be able to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, like Nigel said, there's a ton of clubs. People decide to join on um, clubs that 
are along the lines of things they already knew they were interested in. A lot of people also choose to join clubs that are totally different than what they think they might be interested in. Maybe there's, um, maybe you're interested in small animal, but you join like the small ruminant club or something like that. It gives you both some exposure to a different area so you can um, learn about it more, but also you never know what you end up actually turning out to like. So one problem with vet school is you come in thinking, oh, I'm interested in oncology, and then everything actually sounds super interesting. So then you're interested in way more things than you originally even came in with. And being involved in clubs helps you um, kind of hone your interests and make sure you're being exposed to everything that you can possibly be exposed to. Um, there's really pretty low commitment with clubs. So it's, you can basically pick and choose what, once you join a club, you can basically pick and choose what you decide to do with them. Like Nigel said, you can actually get involved like in the leadership of that club, but also a lot of clubs will offer, um, dinner lectures where you come, eat a burrito, and um, learn about a specific maybe endocrinopathy or something about a small about small animals, just for instance. Um, so it's like an extra learning op opportunity, you socialize with your friends, you get free dinner, it's, it's a good deal. Um, you also, a lot of clubs offer wet labs, which is basically doing hands-on work with, um, and being basically having some exposure to actual um, like surgeries or um, ultrasound, different diagnostic imaging. Um, the Emergency Medicine Club also actually gets to volunteer in the critical care unit. So it's a really good way to get your hands on real live animals in your first couple years when you're doing a lot of the classroom stuff. Um, so there's just a ton of things to get involved in. Um, not everything is directly animal. There's a new diversity club um, that's associated with vet med, um, just trying to get more exposure to different um, cultures and different aspects of veterinary medicine in terms of serving like um, indigent populations and things like that. Um, there's different things associated with wellness. There's just a ton of things you could do. Um, as far as research is concerned, like Nigel brought up, actually that brings us to our next question, um, which was, do professors at CSU offer research internships or volunteer work to undergraduate students who are interested in vet school and also to veterinary students? Um, and I can actually, like Nigel said, mention um, my experience with that. So um, one awesome thing that I found here at CSU is I was not sure if I was interested in research. Um, I hadn't, I didn't have any experience with research, but I was really interested in oncology. Um, so I wanted to try, give research a try. Um, I actually hadn't seen the inside of like the life science lab since I was a freshman in high school. Um, but even without having any direct experience, I was actually able to get a position in one of the labs. Um, just, I mean, they obviously knew I didn't have any experience and they were still willing to take me on um, so I could learn those activities and contribute to a lab. And um, even I basically went from not knowing how to even pipette in the first um, like week of my job to running full on like vaccine exper experiments and um, all kinds of like ELISA assays and basically keeping cell populations alive and all kinds of things that I absolutely couldn't do at the beginning of the summer. I got to present um, a poster at a conference and at our research day. And um, so there's a lot of opportunities. The thing I would say about that is if you're interested in that at all, is just to um, reach out to professors. I have almost never been discouraged from doing anything at CSU, whether it's working in the teaching hospital or shadowing or, um, or doing this research work. It's just a matter of finding the right professors and being persistent about it and showing them that you're um, really interested in, in working with them. Um, so, and and I shouldn't um, give short shrift, shrift to people who already have research experience. There's definitely opportunities for them also. Obviously, they can hit the ground running in a lab um, since they would have more experience than, than I started out with. Um, Nigel, did you have anything to add to that? I mean, I just follow up that there is a uh, ton of hands-on opportunities, um, whether it's with live animals or not. Um, and so I participated on a fairly small research project with one clinician um, over the past been about nine months. Um, also presented at the research day. Um, that's something that CSU does and holds um, every spring. And it really highlights all the research that is performed within at least the uh, College of Veterinary Medical and Biomedical Sciences. And so it's amazing to walk around the room and see not only your friends, but your peers um, 
and clinicians, residents, interns, all presenting research and male knowledge is being produced coming out of this program. Um, it's phenomenal to be part of. That's a really good point, actually. Just even having been able to meet so many different people who are doing so many amazing things it has been an awesome part of the research experience also. All right, next question. What are some courses you get to take to get your veterinary degree? Nigel, as a fourth year who's almost done with all of them, let me let you start with that one. You know, I'm happy fourth year. I haven't had to take any courses. So um, the kind of setup here for CSU, uh, and Janet can correct me if I'm wrong, first two years um, are uh, primarily in class um, lecturing. Your third year, um, you spend some weeks, um, the morning time is dedicated for you to be in clinics. So you are applying some of the knowledge and you, know, you get to be on the clinical floor, you get to be working up cases next to your seniors, residents and clinicians. Uh, fourth year is the entire time is spent um, on clinics. So. The first year, I think the two classes that everyone is concerned about and thinks about the most is anatomy and physiology. Uh, starting second year, or starting uh, the spring semester of that first year, you get start taking a lot of the ologies. Uh, second year, a lot of time is, is again, uh, spending the ologies, but also getting into our clinical sciences courses, which I think is uh, one of the highlights of the education I've got here. They start bringing, you know, full picture together for you to having to start applying your knowledge and really prepares you for clinics and then eventually going out to be a vet. Yeah, that's total. That's a great answer because as a second year right now, um, in the classes that Nigel just mentioned, as far as clinical sciences and the like, it really is um, basically you spend most of your time learning about different disease processes and how to interpret different diagnosis or different diagnostic tests to come up with a diagnosis. Um, and honestly, what I can say the most about how exciting that is, is before you take those classes, or at least in my experience, um, you're wondering how am I ever going to be able to actually do this? Like when you take your, when I take my own animal to the vet and then he or she puts his hands on the, on the dog and kind of does this physical exam and they could tell if something's enlarged or whatever. And you're just like, how are you ever going to be able to do this yourself? And then after second, you know, after second year, even just in the first half of second semester that we've just completed, I am stunned how much I didn't know in January and how much I know now in the end, at the end of March, it's, absolutely amazing. I had to take my own dog in over spring break um, for some internal medicine stuff. And it was definitely the first time where I was like, oh my gosh, I'm actually kind of driving some of his tests. Like I'm suggesting what we should do from here, or I'm reading his blood work and seeing, you know, what I think. Um, it was truly amazing. So I think that's um, the most exciting part to me so far. Um, I think Nigel did a great job of covering the first year. Um, you definitely spend most of your time in anatomy and physiology. And I think the first year gives you a really strong basis of the vocabulary and that you're going to need to actually learn how to do things in your, uh, mainly in your uh, second year and then beyond. All right, next question. So what were some specific things you did in your application that helped you get into the program? So Nigel? I think they're speaking specifically about the application as opposed to which things we maybe participated in um, that we obviously we got to put on our application, but maybe how we arranged our application and that sort of thing. Maybe the essay. Yeah, I, I mean, I wish I knew what part of the application the committee looked at and uh, liked the most because I really, uh, I'm not sure. I just tried to highlight who I was. Um, like Stacy, I did have some a lower GPA from undergrad. Um, I tried to highlight that I'd had better grades through um, my master's program and the end of my undergrad career. Essay, you know, I tried to be unique. I'm not sure. I think probably the thing that will stand out to the committee is they review your application. It's kind of small things, making sure group grammar is correct, um, punctuation, just you know, proofreading it, having someone look at your application that either has never looked at before or doesn't know you. So they just go through and kind of um, give you some suggestions and recommendations because you can 
review it a hundred times and miss a couple words in there, or make some errors um, without having someone else look at it with you. Yeah, I definitely think leaving yourself time to review it and re-review it is critical. Like, um, because you, I looked at my application a million times and even and had other people look at it and I still found one tweak in my personal essay after I had already submitted it, even though I read it a thousand times. <laughs> I think it was really subtle, hopefully, since I still got in. But, um, but um, I think probably the most important thing to do is um, have a personal essay that is a personal essay. So something that reflects you as a person, maybe, and not necessarily, maybe Janet can speak to this when I'm done and correct me if I'm wrong, but not just a chronological highlight of like what you've ever done to deserve to get into veterinary school, because a lot of that is covered on your application in other places, but something that helps, it's really kind of your only opportunity to have the um, admissions committee really get to know you so something that you can have shine through on a personal level in your personal essay is critical. Um, I think also you'll find if you haven't looked at the application yet, there are um, areas in the application you talk about some of the things that might be unique to your background, um, things that um, maybe speak to how you did as an undergraduate or things that were challenges that you had to overcome um, maybe that made it a little bit more challenging for you to get through college or just different areas in the application that also give you um, opportunities to let the admissions committee know about you personally. Um, and then making sure you don't, like I said earlier, making sure you don't leave things out that you are maybe underestimating the importance of that you did um, your volunteer, you know, some volunteer work that you're just kind of uh, not not attribute you're not connecting with vet school with being important for getting into vet school or a job that you might have had as an undergraduate that you think wasn't that important but maybe it was because that just showed like your perseverance of um, working while you were an undergraduate or something like that don't don't forget things um, that make you who you are and um, the cliche advice of all time of being yourself I think is really important because I think usually when you read something that somebody's written that's not from the heart, you can kind of tell. And so that's, you don't want your personal essay or any portion of the written part of your um, application to read like that. So Janet, <laughs> what do you think on that question? I think she did answered that very well. Um, there, are, you, There's a lot of places in the application where you can do a lot of entries by dates or chronological order, that kind of thing. And then the, to use, like Stacy said, use the other sections of the application to present things about you that the committee can't get in the experience section or in the academic section. Use the sections that to, um, there are some sections in our Colorado application that ask about unique experiences. Use that to um, explain a little bit more about yourself. Certainly there's the personal essay. Um, use that to not restate everything that was you already put in the application, but to use it as a section to talk about things you weren't able to put in the other sections. Talk about yourself, why you're, what you have are, is unique about you, what you have to offer the profession, and maybe what you understand the challenges in the profession to be. So use the other sections of the application for those kind of things. Okay, here's another question for you, Janet. Um, if I'm not accepted to vet school on my first attempt, is there a way to get feedback from the admission com committee on my application? Um, unfortunately, you, we have a way to, well, not unfortunately, we do have a way to give you feedback. Unfortunately, we can't, it won't come from the committee. What we've done is we've developed a, a um, very detailed document that's a self-guided review for people who are not admitted. And it's about four pages long, so it is very detailed, and it goes through all the sections on the application. It goes through your academics, it goes through the GRE test scores, it goes through your experience, your community activities, um, and it it lets it asks you questions so that you can kind of evaluate where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are, and kind of 
where maybe you can do better if you decide you want to apply again. So we have that, and we also have a video on our website that talks about um, what the committee likes to see in applications and how to build a strong application. And I would really recommend both of those. They're both very good sources of information for um, people who are not admitted the first time. The other thing you should know is a majority of people are not admitted the first time so uh, and do apply again. So keep that in mind. I would just add to that from my amateur perspective is that in my own class, the people that I know who have shared that they applied several times to get in, even as many as four times, are some of my very favorite people in the class. So there's really like no, not necessarily like a cut and dry that, you know, I didn't get in two times. There must be something that is against me in this way because it's not, that's not true. And really great people don't get in um, a first time or a second time. And so if you're really, really serious about it, then you just have to keep persevering. <laughs> All right, so this is going to be our last question tonight. Um, what other veterinary schools were you originally interested in, and why did you decide to attend CSU? So, Nigel, I'll give that one to you first. I'll just add, I'll just add a question real quick. Um, you know, I was a two time, well, technically a three time applicant. I applied after my junior year in undergrad, which really I didn't have a complete application, I didn't have the grades to show for that. So, I did apply after my senior year, didn't get accepted did a master's and then came and applied again and was able to be accepted. So for anyone out there that didn't get accepted the first time, go ahead and give it a try. Um, specifically, um, I looked at other schools um, in the West. I'm from Colorado. That was kind of where I wanted to stay and go for school. I, without attending those schools, I can't tell you um, really the specifics. What I do know is I have no regrets about coming to Colorado. Um, I think I have receive one of the best educations possible. The opportunities outside of the classroom are phenomenal, and I don't think I could have got a better education at any other university. Yeah, I, thanks, Nigel. I um, actually also am kind of in a unique position where I didn't really consider other schools other than CSU. Um, what brought me to veterinary medicine was the amazing care that my own dog had with the Animal Cancer Center at CSU and just the passion I found in the people here. That's why I decided to do this in the first place. Um, and I can definitely say I've never been disappointed. I think, like I said earlier, as having like a seven year plan, I don't think I could stay as motivated and as excited about it if it weren't for the people at CSU, the clinicians, the professors, my fellow students. It's just all amazing. and. I honestly like pinch myself like every day that I get this opportunity, um, even usually on bad days. <laughs> um, um, the things I will say just from other like friends of mine and just other people that I've had the opportunity to talk to at other schools, um, there are definitely other great vet schools out there. So I don't mean to make this um, just all about us. Um, one thing that's great about us is that we have a, um, we're in a pretty populated area of Colorado without it being a super, you know, intense metropolitan area. Um, so we draw like a huge caseload for our hospital that we see 40,000 cases a year and that gives students a big opportunity to see a wide variety of cases. Um, so uh, we, we have a pretty big class and that's why we're able to support um, such a huge caseload and just um, with emphasis in all the different specialties that people can be boarded in. Um, and just kind of like Nigel said, I don't, I definitely can't say anything specific about other schools, but um, I've just loved my experience here at CSU. In fact, I'm almost sad that I'm almost already at the end of my second year because it's just so fantastic. So, um, yeah, it's just, I, I just honestly, I just can't say enough about our faculty, our administration, our support that we have with um, besides faculty, there's just a lot of administrative support in the program and I just, I honestly can't say enough about it. Um, so with that, we have to end our program tonight. Um, there's a few questions I think we didn't, weren't able to get to, but we'll be sending emails out to those folks um, answering their questions specifically. Um, if you wanna watch the Hangout again, it will be on, C on the Colorado State University YouTube page. 
um, and then also on the veterinary teaching hospital um, face page. Um, and then if you can make it to pre-vet day on April 16th, we would love to have you. Um, we hope to see you then. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Nigel. Thanks, Janet. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for attending.